The eyes have only one language, and it's the same everywhere in the world. It applies to everyone, and it is universal. The eyes are not only windows to the soul, they are windows to your health. They're a glimpse at everything from your overall health to many intimate health specifics. And strangely enough, they can show even your political leanings. Your eyes showcase your sense of style. They can reveal how healthy you are. They can reveal your personality, your emotions, if you're stressed, and even if you're lying. If you're ill or just a bit under the weather, the first place it's likely to show is in your eyes. Let's see if we can define sclerology. It has been called the science and art of observing the markings in the whites of the eyes and their relation to systemic health. The sclera's subtle array of lines and colors and gels and pigments, clouds, films, and crystals offer a whole field of data detailing the effects on the body of diet, genetics, your thoughts, your emotions, emotional stresses, and the movement of various energies within the body-mind. In doing health evaluations using the scleras, we take into account many signs, like some that we see here. Um, most of the signs we are looking at in the scleras are lines. We look at line origin and destination, line configuration, uh, its thickness, brightness, and hue compared to other lines, straightness and curvedness uh, relative to virtuosity, uh, its juxtaposition to the iris, uh, their length, their color, and much more. So what do these markings represent? In this particular photo, we're seeing stress and congestion in the thyroid and spinal column on the left side of the body. The markings in the sclera are essentially showing us then stress and congestion. Yes, they also show us levels of drug deposition, the effects of parasites, the development of abnormal tissue, uh, problems with blood pressure, and a great deal more. All kinds of specifics. However, most basically we are seeing stress and congestion. So what is stress and what is congestion? We are calling it the presence of abnormal concentrations of any single or combination of certain elements within a vessel, organ, or tissue area, causing obstruction and thus interfering appreciably with normal function. This is essentially a medical definition and it's good enough for us. Let's take a look at a few examples of sclera markings and their implications. A basic congestion line is a single line that usually begins as a primary or a genetic line. Then it's, it starts to show its sign of congestion in that part of the body. By contorting, it, get, it gets thicker and maybe it gets brighter. Uh, if the person continues down the road of dietary insult and life negative lifestyle, this line is going to get, grow thicker. It can grow more contorted, more tortuous and twisting. It can send off branches, showing its negative influence on other tissues or organs. It, it may fork or angle, or any combination of these. And all of this is uh, in the process of showing ever-increasing stress and congestion. Here's an, another example of the basic congestion line. Probably something like 80% of the time, these lines, these basic congestion lines, are genetic markers. Uh, influence lines uh, involve simple or complex secondary pathology, secondary pathology. Such pathology could take the form of various vessels, various levels of congestion, toxicity, uh, negative influence, the spreading of disease, it could, they could be showing trauma, tumor, or other type of injury to the receiving organ from the giving organ. In this case, with the fork-like uh, line combination on your right, we're looking at the kidney's negative influence on the pancreas. The line combination on your left shows the cecum's uh, negative influence on the liver. Now, both organs are stressed and congested 
but the thicker ones are the more exaggeratedly so. So how do we know to which organs that these lines are referring? How do we figure that out? By simply placing a map transparency over the photo on your computer screen, you can locate these areas of stress and congestion. So, and that's just the beginning. The influence line provides us with a graphic illustration of, get this, bidirectional and multi-level relationships between or among the involved systems, organs, or tissues of the body, those with which the sclera is communicating. The scleras allow us to see these organ relationships in considerable detail, how they communicate with each other and what they are communicating. In this particular case, we're looking at relationships among the right adrenal, the cecum, the right kidney, the pancreas, and the liver. Uh, many signals are being sent back and forth here, and we can see them. We know, for example, that on the gross physical level, the problem started with the adrenal. Most of the congestion is in the cecum and the kidney, and there are several factors involved in the development of this process. In this line combination, our focus is an immune compromise line. The vertical line in this photo is called an IC, or immune compromise line. Notice how this IC line, which is connected with the left upper quadrant, appears to emanate from, or otherwise joins with, this very recent and active congestion line coming from the thymus area, which of course involves the lymphatic immune. Now, taking into account the relationship between the thymus and the spleen, notice how that big thick line, the one that's between the thymus and the spleen, goes directly from the thymus into the spleen. Then, note how there is a short influence line moving inferiorly into the spleen area, and that another short influence line emanates from the thymus to the, emanating from the thymus to the spleen line then moves superiorly upward into the arterial heart area. So the thymus, spleen, and heart are all connected here. And also to something in the left upper quadrant, likely a function of the brain. So what could all this mean? We need to follow the dots, which involves reviewing their symptoms and asking questions. Technically speaking, okay, ready for some technical? The immune system is highly integrated with other physiological systems and is sensitive to virtually every hormone in the body. Sympathetic, parasympathetic, and sensory nerves, meanwhile, innervate endocrine organs, which produce the hormones and communicate with the immune. Endocrine hormones, of course, affect cells all over the body. The immune's white cells have the remarkable capacity to distinguish themselves from other microbes, especially hostile ones, in protecting the body from infectious and malignant challenges. The immune responds to environmental challenges in a coordinated pattern of gene expression. The result is rapid and sustained production of activated white cells, secretory products, and effector, uh, effector mechanisms that uh, persist until the disease challenge is eliminated. If the immune is too weak, like after years of fighting a losing battle all over the body, we have chronic degenerative disease. How much does that happen? All the time. Most people have little idea how this happens, so they continue the poor diet and lifestyle habits uh, that only contribute to the disease process. Our role as healers, of course, is to teach the patient how to get and keep a strong immune and to encourage them to participate in the healing process. Here's another example of an immune compromise line. We're looking at a QIC, or quadrant immune compromise. This means that all of the organs and tissues in that entire quadrant have suffered an immune compromise. The average loss is per perhaps 18% of immune protection. Since we are in a medial quadrant here, the medial quadrants being toward the nose, the IC marker in this case has an added implication of neuroendocrine immune interactions involving the HPA axis. 
This occurs when the IC line connects the hypothalamus and the pituitary, which are in the upper quadrants, with the adrenals, which are in the lower quadrants. Of course, unless we look into the right upper quadrant and the right lower quadrant, we won't know for sure where our IC line is going. In other words, which other organs it's connecting with. In this particular case, we at least know for sure that the thyroid, another crucial endocrine organ, is involved. Let's put a map on it to be sure. Like many other bodily and behavioral responses to health challenges, immune system responses are initially beneficial. But, as we've suggested, when they're sustained over periods of time, their effectiveness can be reduced. The potential threat is minimized by the immune's high level of uh, regulation and its close integration with the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine. So as long as the system is kept strong by a pure high raw diet and life positive lifestyle, no problem. Bidirectional interaction of common chemical messengers and cellular receptors connects the immune system with the nervous and endocrine. In this interactive communication among systems, sensory stimuli to the central nervous system that activates the HPA axis results in the peripheral release of adrenal steroids and catecholamines, both of which can have immunoregulatory effects. For all this to happen, we healers have to get to the consent of the patient to change his or her act, to improve their diet, and, and to get serious about life-positive lifestyle changes. Yes, we can give them herbs and supplements and various natural treatments, all of which will help, but their participation in the purification and healing processes is crucial to their success. Somehow, we have to get them to understand and value this to the point of action. A pinguicula is a yellowish or clear gel-like growth on the conjunctiva near the limbus. It appears on the sides of the eyes at 3 o'clock and the 9 o'clock positions. It's a change in the normal conjunctiva tissue that results in a deposit of either protein or fat or calcium or some combination of those. It's like a skin callus. In sclerology, a pigwicula is an indication of liver and or gallbladder distress from superheated fats and oils, usually meaning from fried or processed foods. When the pinguicula is yellowish, the liver is more involved. When relatively clear, the gallbladder is implicated. A pinguicula is different from a pterygium. You might be thinking of a pterygium. A pterygium, which is not shown here, uh, grows over the cornea and develops feeder vessels. The pinguicula does not. When you see a pinguicula, look at the thyroid area because of the direct relationship between nutrition and hormones. The foods we eat and the vitamins, the minerals, and the nutrients available to the body ultimately regulate the synthesis and use of thyroid hormones. We are what we eat, right? So thyroid hormones influence the metabolic rate of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Of course, when we do our sclera evaluation, we want to be thorough. We want to learn as much as we can about these relationships, always checking the net and Googling to learn the latest on what others have found. Forks, which is what you're seeing here, are among the many signs that we see in the scleras. Forks come in a variety of shapes and sizes. They can be wobbly, they can be straight, they can be even or uneven, they can be tiny, and they can be quite large. Uh, significant injuries show up as forks, such as fractures, wounds, dislocations, concussions, and compressions, even conditions resulting from prolonged exposure and poisoning. Some forks show metabolic trauma from inflammatory processes. We're talking biochemical responses to stress, to injury, to poor nutrition, and so on. Forks can represent dietary traumas via either inflammatory, like inflammation from dietary insult, or alteration in body chemistry due to poor nutrition. 
The sclera reports all of these. You just need to know the language. Forks can also represent gross mineral imbalances resulting in stone formation. They can show up from drug abuse and they can be caused by tumors. The encapsulation, which is what you're seeing here, this little spot at the end of a line, that sign involves the enclosure of the, uh, by the body of one or more of a variety of materials from fatty cells to parasites. This uh, encapsulation sign is medically referred to as the Axenfeld's nerve loop. Technically then, encapsulations are like little tumors. Uh, encapsulation characteristics include uh, appearing as an enclosed or raised fatty blob on the surface of the uh, episclera. Uh, most of the time they are benign. They're usually at the end of a line. They are located typically three to four millimeters from the limbus. Uh, they occur more in darkly pigmented people. They're tender to the touch. I've already tested this with a Q-tip, they are. They are sometimes associated with a fermentation sign, and they can also end in a neoplasm sign, especially an N3 neoplasm sign. In about 12% of sclera evaluations, we find encapsulations. So they're not all that common. Only about 1% of encapsul encapsulations are bilateral, both eyes. 70% are found in the lower quadrants and toward the nasal and medial canthus. They're often seen in women with a history of uterine fibroids. 62% are found anterior to the eye's vertical rectus muscle insertions, which means you'll see them in the upper quadrants. Now, this is vessel pooling and it looks like a string of pearls or microdots on the sclera. It indicates local areas of sluggish circulation and the pooling of blood in vulnerable areas of blood vessels. They're like these little ballooned areas that you're seeing that develop the kind that used to develop in the old car tire inner tubes, those of you who remember those. Uh, in some sense, they're also a lot like that in terms of their vulnerability, the vulnerability that they represent in the body. When viewed through a slit lamp, you can see how little tiny blood cells get trapped in those little ballooned areas and they go round and round and they lose some of their lifespan. We often see vessel pulling in people with poorly controlled or uncontrolled diabetes. Vessel pooling, sometimes called microaneurysms medically, these are sometimes found in the retina of the eye, the back of the eye, but here, of course, we're seeing them at the limbus in the front of the eye in patients with medically diagnosed diabetes. These microaneurysm signs are signals in the eye of actual miniature aneurysms within the body that can rupture and leak blood. The fermentation sign uh, shows that you're seeing here, it shows pancreas metabolism dysfunction with associated bacterial involvement. Notice how we didn't use the terms hypoglycemia or diabetes. The generic term pancreas metabolism dysfunction or PMD covers a broad area and includes the medically described and named processes. Okay, so where we had previously associated the fermentation marker with carbohydrate metabolism only, we've since realized that it's the pancreas function as a whole organ that's involved, including both endocrine and exocrine aspects of pancreas function. The dysfunction is shown by the line and it has these tiny, mostly dark blue spots at the end and they're arranged in a kind of a circular pattern. Sometimes these dots can be brownish, they could be grayish or even black. We believe that the patch of dots represents bacteria living off the metabolites resulting from 
the incomplete food processing involved in the pancreas metabolism management of foods. Think of it as like a fermentation, and that's where it got its name. The line tends to appear a bit more in darker-eyed persons and more often in the upper quadrants. We know that brown-eyed people have more of a genetic tendency to pancreas metabolism dysfunction, and we also know that the brain uses proportionally more sugar than do other parts of the body. When you see the fermentation sign, check for symptoms of hypoglycemia and be sure to observe any markings in the pancreas area of the right lower quadrant. And of course, in the many pancreas areas of the irises. It's well known that literally millions of people are walking around these days with not only hypoglycemia, but clinical level diabetes. Uh, these are epidemic in the world right now, thanks to the crap food industry, plus cooperation from corporate media advertising and branches of the federal government. What we're looking at here are markers involved in the left lower quadrant. Note that the, the pancreas's fat and protein um, functional difficulties are emphasized when markers appear in those specific areas of the pancreas in the right lower quadrant. Notice also that we now have reason to believe that the tail of the pancreas, which is shown here in this left lower quadrant, indicates information on the physical as well as the emotional aspect of that organ. The marking on your right originates in the rectum and it terminates in the E pancreas or emotional pancreas. The blue cast Okay, this is exciting. It's a blue cast, a blue hue over the entire sclera. If you remember from your anatomy, the sclera is a dense, poorly vascularized connective tissue structure that's composed of six types of uh, collagen, plus elastin, proteoglycans, and glycoproteins. The characteristic, very slightly pale blue sclera that you see in children is caused by thinness and thus relative transparency of the sclera's collagen fibers that allow us to see a little bit of the underlying uh, darkly pigmented uvea layer in the back of the eye. So a number of inflammatory and non-inflammatory processes can affect the sclera in adults causing the blue hue. In the non-inflammatory category, we have those disorders that thicken the sclera and those that thin it. Okay, so how did the scleras get blue like that in this adult? And what can result from it? Here are the main possibilities. And the first three of these that I'm going to name are the most prevalent. The first is venous insufficiency, which can lead to thrombosis and varicosity. The second is uh, inadequate oxygen. It's very common. Or hypoxemia especially to the brain and other tissues. And this can cause many problems, starting with shortness of breath, moving to anxiety or restlessness, fatigue, headaches, all the way to impaired brain function. And that shows up as decreased attention span, confusion, and disorientation. How many people that you know are already displaying those? So you always need to be checking your symptoms over against your sclera signs. The third is poor circulation. It's the third most frequent cause of this blue cast. Uh, then anemias are possible, including iron deficiency, but many other minerals could be involved, not just iron. Uh, catabolic dysfunction could cause the blue cast, meaning problems eliminating food toxins and other wastes at the cellular level. Then there's brittle bone disease, or osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a congenital disorder detected early in childhood and resulting in uh, skeletal deformities and possible hearing loss and uh, even dental deform uh, deformities and abnormalities. Some medications like steroids, when they're taken for long periods of time, can also produce the blue sclera. Uh, certain syndromes can have blue sclera as a presentation, such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, pseudoxanthoma elasticum, and Marfan syndrome. We describe all of these in our sclerology course. 
When patients or clients come to you for help and you haven't heard of the disorder that they name, what do you do? You Google it. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me check that out. Get the latest medical perspective on it. Find out what naturopaths are saying about it. Learn what you can about the disorder. Uh, consider the patient's circumstance as a whole. Feel into what you would do and then you proceed with their, their recommendation. Uh, at first, we referred to this sign as a snake in a hose, kind of a comical name, which is what it looks like, until we noticed that it had a medical name, which was the bordered meander. And we like that name better, so that now we just refer to it as the bordered meander. So you'll see a meandering vessel bordered by stratish vessels. This is another of the more advanced cardiovascular signs. In some real sense, this sign is what medical professionals term arteriosclerosis. It shows arterial congestion, it shows vessel hardening, vessel thickening, loss of elasticity, and also vessel wall degeneration. Unlike atherosclerosis, uh, arteriosclerosis only affects small arteries and arterios. Artery, arterials. <laughs> um, atherosclerosis, on the other hand, uh, is about the narrowing of arteries from a buildup of plaque inside them. Uh, the plaque is made up of cholesterol, fatty substances, cellular waste products, calcium, and fibrin. This affects large and medium-sized arteries, but its positioning varies from person to person. But once again, with this bordered meander sign, we're looking at smaller arteries and arterioles. Uh, and when these guys get clogged, there can be real danger. When we see the bordered meander in brain areas, we should check the pupil for vertical ellipses. If these two occur together, there is a real potential for hemorrhagic stroke. This means loss of blood supply to the brain, and that can be deadly. So when you see this sign in the upper quadrants, immediately check for vertical pupils. At Grand Medicine, we've been presenting live courses in various countries for many years, but none in the USA for the past two years. In October of 2015, we will present the only live courses in sclerology this year here in the USA. Both the sclerology basics and advanced courses, four days each, with one day in between, here in Lake San Marcos, California. We are accepting only eight persons per class, so contact us right away. A low-cost hotel is nearby. If you have not studied sclerology yet, here is your chance in a rare live class. For more details, email us at gm at grandmedicine.com or phone us at the USA number on your screen. Learn sclerology. You'll be amazed at what you can see. Thank you so much for watching.